yeah okay so so far in this course you guys uh, seen how to design lot of things starting with an op amp and in the last couple of weeks we saw how to make a uh, lot of useful circuits using op amps like band gap reference uh, voltage regulators etc and uh, this band gap reference and regulators are something you will find on any uh, chip nowadays right because you need to have some supply and the supply needs a voltage reference so these are kind of what you say uh, a necessary part of any chip okay and in the last class we also looked at this uh, idea of constant gm biasing so we still now we have seen a uh, lot of things on you know schematic design so in today's last class i'll give a brief glimpse into uh, layout so and for that i'll resort to uh, my least form of you know my least preferred way of teaching which is using slides but i'll go through it there is the okay. so yeah let me change this to uh -huh. yes so uh, today i'll just give you a brief glimpse into uh, some analog layout techniques because schematic is a important part but after i mean you by this time you guys know that after uh, just one second after schematic you have to uh, do something called layout right so let me see yeah so after schematic you have to do layout uh, and i mean typically in the industry i mean uh, this designer doesn't typically do the layout for layout you have specialized people but still uh, it is important for you to know what are some things that need to be done in the layout so that your schematic works as you expect right because you can't again operate in open loop you need to give some inputs to your layout engineer so that he or she will be able to make sure your schematic works as you expect so let's start with a simple example here so i've taken a uh, inverting amplifier let me see if i can oh, yeah so i mean now you guys you guys know how to make an op amp so uh, let's say now we have to make these two resistors right so as you know output is two times the input in gain and what sets the gain as two here it's the ratio of the two resistors right so essentially uh, you are not interested in the absolute value of the resistors but you should make sure that even if the resistor values change themselves the ratio has to be exactly two right so let's see how you might go about laying out this so one obvious thing is to basically you know like have one instance r and twice you know a larger uh, instance that gives a resistance to r so do you think this is fine or uh, is there something you can do better i mean remember the goal is to make sure the two elements you have i don't care if their absolute values change as long as the ratio of the values is exactly 2 right so with that in mind do you think this is better or can you do better that's the question exactly. yeah why Two R variation is different. Ah, uh, what did you say? Sorry, what should we do? Separate the resistor to R and transfer to instance of R. Ah, so that is something uh, that is that typically done. The reason, lot of reasons are there. One simple reason is, see, this is a resistor. Finally, to make connection, you will put something called as a wire. Wire is essentially a connector that connects it to metal lines. So, right, metal is where you are going to make all connections. So, when you put a wire like this, now you see uh, carriers will electrons will flow in a narrower lane here. and then kind of spread out here so the effective resistance of this block is not same throughout right because uh, here the resistance might be something in the middle region it might be it might be something here it might be something now if you have twice long i mean twice uh, i mean uh, uh, an instance which is twice as long as this you can clearly see the resistance value will not exactly scale so a better thing to do is like you suggested you have two identical copies of the resistor and kind of put them in series so that is typically number one you if you want to have an instance which is two times or three times larger than the first instance you replicate items and put things in series or parallel right and next is would you think uh, do you think uh, this is better that is i have the one instance of the resistor put in horizontal other in the vertical direction that is is this better or this is better with respect to the fact that i want to have perfectly matched resistors 
do you think having the same orientation for all of these is better or having let us say uh, different orientations is better at least logically same orientation is better again lot of reasons because here you see charge carriers are flowing in the horizontal directions here it will flow in vertical directions it might face different interactions from the outside you know lot of things here so there is nothing technical here just make sure you follow logic and use your common sense that's all no that is not we'll come to that that that's a completely different thing we can have we'll come to that but this is to the fact that if you have uh, two in, uh, instances placed in two different orientations things outside world will impact this guy differently outside world impact this guy differently right so this is not something you should do you try to keep the same orientation for all the elements that you want to be matched right and the other thing is uh, here i have shown this wire typically uh, it, it is not advisable to put a single wire to make a contact again simply because uh, think uh, from the worst case point of view in case this wire is not making proper contact you are screwed so always put multiple wires so that you are guaranteed that there is some contact all the time right so i'll not now show the connections i'll just show it like this so now we have r and to r right so now again tell me uh, just by looking at it can you tell me if there is something different for the three resistors here ignore the metal connection let's say that is ignorable right with respect to the three resistors just by inspection if you look at it what do you think is different for the three resistors individually yeah see as he saying the environment is different right here this resistor is not seeing anything here but to the right it sees one identical copy of the resistor the middle guy sees two identical copies of the resistor this guy doesn't so at least uh, visually it looks like the environment is different for each of them you want everything to be matched you make sure you have the same environment right i mean so it's like you know you i, I cannot compare you know grades you score in this subject with the grades you score in another subject right so to have a fair comparison and make sure things are fine everyone must have the same environment so that's what you do so uh, to make sure the environment or the ambience is same we typically add what is called dummies yeah dummies essentially it's an identical copy of the resistor placed on the extremes to make sure that the environment is matched but with respect to the circuit behavior they pl they play no role and as you see since they are not playing any role i'm just shorting the two so it doesn't affect you this is just existing to keep the environment same for all the resistors okay which one the this yeah that's i mean see this i've drawn it so this need not be as uh, wide as this this for uh, representation point of view i've shown cool so now let's just take this case so uh this is nice but it turns out in practice uh, when you fabricate things there will be a uh, what is called as a linear gradient that is basically fabrication consists of multiple steps and each step things will be happening differently at this point and this point this point this point right for example let us say if you want to dope doping will not happen uniformly there will be some kind of a gradient right other thing is temperature let us say there is some uh, you know circuit here that is burning a lot of power so the temperature here might be higher compared to the temperature at this location so there will be some kind of gradient and let us say the gradient is linear that's what we'll assume if that is the case what will happen is this the resistor here might have a value of r the middle one might have r plus delta r this guy might have r plus 2 delta r right again linear gradient so now you see the two resistors in series will give an effective resistance of 2r plus 3 delta r the single instance is giving you r the ratio is screwed up right so obviously i cannot do this to get the uh, proper ratio how do you suggest i can uh, do i have three resistors i have to connect two of them in series so that the series resistor is twice the value of the other resistor at least logically makes sense i use the first and the last i mean first and the third here i do this now this is basically 2r plus 2 delta r the middle one is r plus delta r the ratio is maintained right and it doesn't make i mean doesn't take a lot of time to figure out the under uh, i mean underlying principle is your you know high school geometry 
you make sure that things have a common center right because things are you have a linear gradient so if you choose something to be at the center the center point will not change with respect to these two right average of the two extreme points will be equal to the center point that's all so that is what we call as common centroid so you make sure that uh, if you want to have good matching between multiple elements you put all of them in such a way that they share a common centroid okay so this is with respect to having resistors of r and uh, 2r now let us say i want to have r and 4r again the logic is same you put the single instance of the resistor here and 2 and 2 here so once again you get the same okay. again now we can keep extending uh, let us say i want to have r and 8r again the middle one will be the single instance you can basically you know like put four on either ends this will definitely work but now you see that the individual resistors they are far apart right again you know that uh, the standard deviation of mismatch is inversely proportional to the square root of the area but it also turns out it is a function of how far the elements are also placed right farther they are less matching you can expect right so instead of placing them in a single column like this or a single row like this you can basically keep them in a compact arrangement right as a 2d structure so again now you see this one is the single instance now uh, the r2 guys here they are surrounding so the common center is here so once again if you have any linear gradients in the vertical as well as in the horizontal direction that will get actually tapped okay so again the idea is to keep a common centroid and uh, again see here once again to get good matching we can consider adding dummies on the extremes so that will make sure the environment is same right now again you can also consider adding a dummy row of resistors uh, here right in the top row and the bottom row as well so that is also something you can do to make sure uh, the environments are very nicely matched so basically to summarize uh, you make sure that if you want to have elements that are nicely replicated i mean if you want to have elements that are multiples of each other you don't have uh, you know like larger bits larger longer lengths you have the same instance replicated multiple times connect them in series or parallel that is rule 1 and of course you make sure that the elements that are supposed to be matched they are all in the same orientation don't put one in horizontal one vertical and yeah to make sure that you have uh, you know like uh, good reliability don't use a single wire always have multiple wires so that even if there is small you know uh, issues with one of the wires you will have good contact and of course uh, these are some basics now to get a even better matching you can add dummies that is basically to keep the ambience same for all the elements that are supposed to be matched and finally as we saw you can Uh, go one step further and keep arrange all the elements so that they share a common centroid right huh. it's rectangle yeah yeah r2 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 okay let me see if i can write here connect the second column also right uh huh okay so let's say do this right uh, so they won't have the same you are saying the uh, charge carriers are flowing one up one down is it uh, that is okay as long as see, vertical direction it's okay right uh, vertical direction is okay but uh, in horizontal direction like so you are saying i mean i'll be basically connecting things like this yeah. right Uh huh. First row, third column. Yeah. Sorry, this guy, this guy. Ah. Uh. I mean, you are saying it's going to be rectangle. Yeah. Uh, okay. Sure. Uh huh. Yeah. True. Everything will be rectangle. Uh, so they won't have the. Uh, the 
distance you are saying that will be different yeah i mean see finally you can't have 100% matching right the idea is to keep as good a matching as possible this is i mean what you are saying is definitely true so these things will contribute to small mismatch finally okay try to make sure uh, to a large extent you are keeping them matched that's all you can't guarantee that two elements kept they are 100% matched so again layout i would always say there is nothing so great it is just a matter of uh, thinking logically and applying common sense right have a bit of ocd make sure things are all nicely aligned everything is symmetric that actually helps so it's more like a, you know like a, uh, i would say laborious work than you know uh, good so this is with respect to passives so yeah and as i mentioned yeah so uh, these three things the first three things they are actually free you don't have to do anything there is no penalty here right now if you moment you go and add dummies it's going to take up some area that is some price we'll have to pay and when you do common centroid as he was also suggesting the routing is going to become complicated because uh, you know when you connect things like this you have to go and route and make sure this guy is not getting shorted to this routing is slightly complex but that is the price you are going to pay to make sure you are having good matching right so this is with respect to passives uh, now let's move on to some things on uh, transistors so let us say you have a simple current mirror like this so again the idea is uh, the, this transistor i mean uh, right side transistor must be twice as wide as the first transistor so now you tell me uh, this is like i mean i have two options the top one i have this as the 1x transistor and i have taken a single instance which is 2x wide do you think this is better or uh, this is better bottom one again i have taken two instances and then putting in parallel that is better so you don't do this you basically do this i have essentially taken two identical copies i have connected drain source and gates and with respect to transistor to get uh, 2x wider widths it turns out you can uh, do two things this is what we saw putting two things in parallel exactly uh, you can also do the following here you see we have two drains you can actually since they are going to be shorted finally you can have a common drain for this right you don't need to have two separate you know like uh, regions here and then short them uh, manually you can share the drain junction so this is called as finger because someone thought it looks like two fingers pointing up i don't know but uh, again uh, the advantage with using fingers is it's going to be more compact the uh, parasitic capacitances will also be slightly smaller because we have lesser and lesser junctions right so uh, and yeah when you put two things in parallel like this this is called as multiplier for obvious reasons and when you share uh, junctions it's called fingers so when you use multiplier it kind of better mimics a 2x device right this is essentially literally putting two of them in parallel so this will make sure that it is exactly 2x but uh, this is not exactly 2x but it is still okay so you typically use this guy when you want to make things compact and you know like have reduced parasitics but if you want to have very exact 2x uh, multiplication you do this so typically we use fingers in cases where uh, i'll show next so let us say uh, now you are designing your diffamp and let us say for your diff pair uh, the nmos size comes out to be 12 micron right so typically you don't use a single instance which has 12 micrometer width because it turns out uh, transistor models you use in practice they might not be valid if you use very wide widths or very small widths in a reasonably uh, medium range the models will work very nicely if you go very low or very high it might not be so good so typically we use a single instance with a few micrometers of width and in this case i have taken let us say 1 micron of width so to get 12 micrometers i can use both fingers and multipliers right so which means final total width will be the number of fingers i use times the number of instances i put in parallel times the width of the single instance so uh, this basically you know like uh, gives lot of room for you to play so one choice is to use 12 fingers and one multiplier i am just using one instance but 12 fingers like this this is something you can do or to make it again compact 
I can do something like this. I can use four fingers and then put three of them in parallel like this. That is also something you can do. Uh, this is shared. This is basically, see this is one transistor, source and drain. This is second transistor, drain and source. Right? Here drain is getting shared between these two transistors. Look at the gate. Gate signifies a transistor, right? This is the first transistor. This is the second transistor. So the drain is shared between these two transistors, right? Now for uh, this and this guy, source is shared. Is this clear? I mean basically you're putting things in parallel and try to share as many junctions as possible. Right? So it becomes source drain source drain alternating. So this is something you can do. Uh, again to get better matching you tend to add dummies. So you add one more extra finger or here and here and then do this and dummies as you know they don't play any role. So you can basically short gate drain and source everything. So that it is off and it's not, uh, you know, drawing any current. So let me not, not show you dummies. So now you typically uh, here I've used total of four fingers. I mean, it turns out you can also use uh, five. I mean, I could also done with three fingers and four multipliers for twelve, right? But typically we tend to choose even number of fingers because here if I have chosen since I have chosen even number of fingers, you see that the entire structure is kind of symmetric, right? Again, any gradients kind of tend to get cancelled and uh, so because of this small reason you try to keep the fingers as even but it's not like a really strict tool, right? If possible try to use even number of fingers that will also ease some of the things with dummies uh, that will not go into a lot of details but yeah. So the, with respect to transistors again uh, you can use multipliers for exact replication, you can use fingers also. And never use one instance with a very large width, use single instance with a few micrometers of width and then to get a wider width use a combination of width, I mean fingers and multipliers. Yeah, and if possible try to use even number of fingers, that's all. Cool. So now with this you let's say you make the op amp, right, and uh, finally you have to connect things. So for that you have to go with, uh, I mean metals, you have to use metal for making connections. And one uh, typical rule we try to follow is this, uh, as you know in most of the CMOS processes you have multiple metal layers, right? You don't have one single metal, you have multiple metal layers like this. And for when you are doing uh, routing, you try to use let us say even metal layers in the vertical direction, odd metal layers for routing things horizontally or vice versa. There is uh, nothing significant here. The only reason is again plain logic. So you do something like this, right? I am using odd metal layers horizontally, even metal layers vertically, correct? Yeah. So uh, one simple reason is this. See, if I uh, let's say I have some connection in M3, metal 3, and let us say vertically also I have routing some other signal, and I am also using metal 3 for that. Now you can clearly see that there could be some unintentional shot, right? So which means now we have to be careful, uh, you have to make sure that let us say this is M3, you are going in M3, if you go this you are shorting, so you go down to a lower metal layer and then route it or you bypass, take a bridge and then go. So you have to be slightly careful here, but if you follow uh, this thing, you are guaranteed that when you are going crisscrossing, there is not going to be any shot. Right? This is one reason why you tend to use again, it is again nothing significant here, it is just logic and common sense. Because if finally you have to have, you will have lot of routings. So you can't be, I mean if you are not careful you might unintentionally short. So uh, to be safe you can consider doing this. So but yeah, so now you do this, uh, now layout is done, but is that the end of the story? Huh? Uh, no, what I am saying is let us say you, you have some two, two nodes here that needs to be shorted. Here also I have two nodes that need to be shorted, right? So what I am saying is if you uh, use her, even uh, odd metal layers in both horizontal and vertical routing, you might end up with a case like this. See? I mean what I am saying is you uh, in your circuit let us say. 
no it's the same metal same see metal layers will be in the same i mean you think of like this right metal layers will be in the same uh, what do you say this direction yeah. vertical direction right so if some metal is going this way if you are routing something it is going in the same layer okay so it will short if you want to go down you have to use a different metal layer so if you have multiple if you if you are doing multiple routings in metal one they'll all be in the same you know like height even if you do this it's going to be in the same height so you have multiple levels of metals at each side you will have a different metal layer that's all no no they will be at different levels yeah i mean this i am drawing a top level picture you can't see this this is basically the top view right that's how you typically see the things yeah yeah so basically it will m1 m2 m3 m4 like this if you look from the top everything will look same right i mean typically again the reason we draw top view is you don't have control on this vertical distance it is fixed so there is no point in drawing a 3d picture so that is why we top view no that is not done usually i mean you won't have one metal here one metal here one metal here right that is basically same metal i mean see it is all the same it's not like different metals are being used for at different uh, levels it's copper used everywhere only the top level you might have aluminum okay so it's all the same uh, you know like copper let us say right so it's the, what you define let us say the metal lines in this side i call as metal 1 metal lines in this side i call as metal 2 it is not like use different elements at each levels okay it is the same element used for connecting just that there are different vertical heights so give different names so so like if you if the shock to bank is the uh -huh. same Uh -huh. Those two lines still be called metal. Yeah, I mean you, that, that's why we call metal one. Metal one means it is at a particular height. That's all. Metal two, it's at a higher height. All the wires are any particular level of thing. Yeah, it's the same element used. Depending on the height at which it is there, we call we give it metal one, metal two, metal three. Typically, at the topmost metal, you might have a low resistive uh, elements like aluminium used for routing, but otherwise it is all the same. All the same element. Cool. So now let us say uh, you finish the layout. The next is uh, you know is the job done. So after layout, uh, some of you might know you have to do something called as a design rule check. That makes sure you know like uh, you are make, making keeping minimum distances between things, and some rules you check. And then is the next logical thing. You make sure whatever you laid out matches what you have in schematic to make sure you know you have done the correct layout. These are some simple things. Uh, next you do what is called as a parasitic extraction. so that is where you extract parasitics because let us say you make simple connection like this for a common source amplifier so it should be vdd it's okay you are shorting let us say these two nodes this will be a metal short you are using a metal line for shorting it unfortunately or fortunately this is not a short so this has a distributed rc network because it's going to have a delay as well as a resistance to model it you have to model with infinite sections of rc with small r and small c again na number of sections you will have depends on the frequency you are interested in people who have taken anything on transmission lines you know this is uh, what we called as a distributed i think so uh, parasitic extraction we do in multiple levels so one you extract only the capacitance with respect to ground right second you extract uh, capacitance with respect to ground and any other coupling capacitor you might have some other routing here let us say here you have some other routing so there will be some coupling between those two routings so you take that also and extract and finally is the you know ultimate thing you extract everything the parasitic resistor capacitor coupling capacitor everything right and typically uh, yeah with respect to coupling one thing uh, can be done so let us say you have a sen sensitive signal and there is some high frequency signal that can basically disturb it to prevent this from getting coupled one thing you can do is this intentionally put ground lines on either sides and then isolate it so this way this sensitive signal is basically coupled only to ground and uh, it's isolated from this this is called shielding cool so now uh, this is the final check you have to do you extract the entire parasitics and then simulate and make sure circuit works and again the fortunate or unfortunate thing is uh, see here i have this as the parasitic network 
let us say I extract only the capacitors, which means I'm making the resistors to be zero. Right? How many nodes I will have in the circuit? No, let us say this is an ideal shot firstly. How many nodes are there? Two nodes. N1, N2. Okay, okay, sorry. If it's a yeah, sorry, one node. If it's an ideal shot, you have one node, ground is the reference node. Okay. Now I don't extract any resistor, only capacitance. How many nodes are there? I mean, all the resistors are considered to be zero. You still have one node. Essentially, if you extract only the capacitors, the number of nodes in your circuit is not going to change. Right? Now I have included resistors also. Now what can you say about the number of nodes? From one, it can go to so many, right? I mean, depending on how accurately I am extracting this shot, the number of nodes can be so much. So typically, <coughs> after parasitic extraction, the number of nodes in your circuits will just explode crazily. Right? So which means your simulation time will also be longer. Right? Because see, remember, finally your circuit simulator is solving some circuit. And how do you think it is solving the circuit? Huh? Sorry? Uh, but what what is the basic law it is going to use? KCL is what is I mean KCL and KVL is there. I mean in for finding KVL you need to find the number of meshes. For KCL you need to find number of nodes. Finding which of the two is easier? Finding nodes is easier or finding meshes easier? Nodes is here because basically nodes is where any element is connecting. So that's what tool is also uh, doing. It will just use KCL and solve it. So we'll have a matrix. If you have uh, 10 nodes, you'll have a 10 by 10 matrix. And then take, I mean, it's like G times V is I. And then V is G inverse of I. So essentially you have to invert a G matrix and then do it. Now if your number of nodes increases, the matrix size is going to blow up. So it's going to take more and more time to compute the inverse. That's all. So yeah, but let us say you make sure that uh, you wait long enough and make sure after extraction things work. So is that the end of the story? Again, uh, again, fortunately, unfortunately, not yet. There is something minor yet. Uh, typically, you extract the inductance also at very high frequencies too. Yeah. Yeah, as he's pointing out, this short is not only having RC. In principle, it is RL and C. You have to extract inductance also. That is true. But yeah, uh, after this, it is not over because finally, this is your chip. Let us say it's taped out. This will be packaged on a package, right? Whatever ICs you are using in your laboratories has a plastic package stuff, right? Inside that you have the actual bare day. So from the bare day, you are you will make contacts to the final parts, and that's when you can typically use it. And remember, this connection has to be having a very very low resistance. So what element do you think we'll use for making this connection? Yeah, gold. That's what we do, right? Yeah, yeah, so essentially that's what in China people scrap all this old ICs and try to take gold, right? I mean, so yeah, but again, because how you'll have long wires like this, long wires will be uh, having an associated inductance. Distance will be, let us say, small because you're using a very low resistivity element. So essentially, this is your chip. I, you think that this voltage source is directly connected to this point, and then it's going to your transistor. Unfortunately, no, you have a long inductance. And typically, again, this is a typical thumb rule, not very exact. The inductance uh, is about one nano Henry per millimeter of the connection here, right? So this is what we call as bond wires. These yellow lines are called bond wires because they are bonding this pin to this pad. <coughs> and these bond wires will have inductance. So in your simulation, you also have to include this bond wire inductance. And make sure in presence of this inductance, you get the required performance. Because finally, you are feeding the signal through the inductance. Right? So again, there are a couple of things you can do. One thing is, let us say you have a lot of pads. I can do the following. I can essentially, from one pad, I can connect it to, let us say, three different pins. And externally, I will be feeding one signal to all of them. Right? If I do that, what will happen to the effective inductance? How much? It will reduce by a factor of 3 because I am putting 3 inductances in parallel. Because now this means that you are losing out a lot of pads. So, again. So, yeah, and if you do this properly, uh, this is how something will look like. So, this is one of the chips. So, as you can see, this is the bad die. You could even see some capacitors and transistors here. This is taken from a, from a phone, right? If you shine in a bright enough light, you can 
typically see things and the wires here you see they are the bond wires connecting to the package and here I have intentionally placed this side of the pins closer so that the bond wire length here is much smaller. I don't have any uh, pins on the top side, I have only on three sides. So I have intentionally placed it to the left so that uh, the pads here they see a smaller bond wire inductance but of course which means the right side it will be longer. So I thought you that this one, this is basically fixed by the package because there are 64 pins here. You have to make sure sufficient gap between here so that we can make good contact, right? It is fixed by the package usually. So this is another thing. Again, this is basically a here you can probably even see the transistors layout clearly. This is again taken from my this my from my smartphone. I mean five, six years back where the it's like I had 48 MP camera, that's all, right? Again, this is messed up, the bond base are all gone, but again, just a representative picture. Right? Yeah, yeah, there are a lot of packages, but uh, finally you will have some inductance everywhere, right? The ball grid array, they will have a smaller inductance, but uh, soldering them will be much difficult. Uh, Which one? Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's what, right? I mean, uh, this is, chip design doesn't end at the point where you finish your schematic. Till it's packaged and it works, your head is rolled. So again, as you see, right, I mean, uh, this entire business of uh, you know, like making sure you design things and things work finally after uh, tape out and testing. That is kind of an art, right? And as you, as I told, uh, after parasitic extraction, simulation time will explode like anything, right? And because of that, you can't randomly. Okay, I can show some layout maybe. Hold on, let's see. If I have things. So let's see if I can show some layout here. So this let us say one layout uh, where again you can see these squares here they are capacitors I want them to be matched so I have kept them in a common centroid like this right. So the X you see here they are all dummies. I put dummies on either sides to make sure the ambience is same. So I can show you an op amp if I can find one here. So here you see uh, this is uh, a cascode op amp actually. So I think this is the diff pair, uh, I think NMOS CAS code is somewhere in this only and these two are the PMOS CAS codes, right. And as you see here, I have used it in a 2x 2D array. I have so, some number of fingers and some multipliers to realize a very wide width. Okay. And typically, uh, again, this is a differential amplifier. So typically for dif uh, laying out differential amplifiers, you lay out one half and then copy and flip it around. So that way it's symmetric. Right, you don't, you know, like individually lay out both halves. That way, there will be an unintentional asymmetry. Typically, you lay out one half and then copy and flip it around. And yeah, and after you uh, do this, run PEX extraction, it's going to take longer. And in fact, I ran something yesterday night, it's still running. Right, and this is not even with parasitic extracted. This is 90% schematic level, it's still taking time. Right, so that's why, right, I mean, uh, this in circuit design, you have to be really uh, sure of what each transistor does in a particular circuit, right? Because otherwise you can't randomly, I mean, let's say some spec is not met. You need to exactly know which transistor I should go and change to meet the particular spec. I can't randomly change things and run 100 simulations and say, hey, I'll wait. Then you have to wait for 100 years. Okay. I mean, and that's exactly why I kind of emphasize on deriving and synthesizing circuits from scratch so that you know what is the basic principle behind the circuit and what each transistor is doing. I mean, it might be easy for me to just show the circuit, analyze it and say, this is what the circuit does, end of the story. But if I keep doing that, I mean, you'll not be able to remember anything, right? I mean, you can remember two, three circuits, but 100 circuits, you can't. Human brain, unfortunately or fortunately, is not good at remembering a lot of random things. But what it is good at is kind of making connections and following a logical sequence, right? So if you know what is the logical sequence in making a particular circuit, you can actually draw it from scratch yourself. You don't have to remember anything. In circuits, all you need to remember is KCL, IV relation of, I mean, V is IR, Q is CV, and square law of MOSFET. If you know these three things, you are set. You can basically derive everything, right? That's all. But yeah, I mean, see, even, uh, so that is why, right? Uh, whatever I've taught here, the same thing has been there for the last several decades, right? If you take an old uh, analog circuit textbook from 1960s, 
whatever you saw most of them will be the same some of the circuits might be new but most of them is the same right and the only difference will be the transistor use that time might be let us say initially you had you know uh, whatever vacuum tubes then you had you know uh, bipolar junction transistors j fed mosfet fin fed next ga fed cnd fed abc fed xyz fed whatever you will have different feds but at the heart of it with respect to small signals everything is i mean with respect to small signals what is a transistor it's a voltage control current source that's all right because see what is a transistor why is it called transistor it's transferring resistor i mean it's a trans resistor i mean which means essentially you are making a switch right and what is a switch you are controlling the current flow in two terminals based on the voltage applied on the third terminal you are essentially controlling the current through a voltage that is that's a voltage control current source okay so whatever uh, you know transistor everyone will be making with respect to us it's a black box it's a voltage control current source as long as you know how to make circuits with a voltage control current source any random transistor comes in the next 30 years or later the circuit will still be the same right i mean that is something nice about analog circuits right unlike some other you know subjects where you know you have to learn and remember lot of things in this regime you have to use this equation the next regime you have to use this equation and 10 years later they will say no this is completely wrong we will come up with a new theory so nothing like that right so it is you know still the same right i mean that's why i jokingly sometimes say i mean see uh, all the you know uh, uh, this bedtime stories and you know uh, stories you might have learned in your ch childhood they might not you know uh, be socially relevant now because culturally and socially we might have evolved a lot but what will be always relevant is the tale of a voltage control current source right <laughs> so you know after you become old you can tell your grandkids hey look at this so voltage control current source if you put it this way you will get an amplification that story will always be relevant okay yeah. see and personally for me right i mean i uh, grew up during the time where there was a huge it revolution right so when i joined my undergrad i wanted to you know like uh, get in you know google or microsoft so i was always you know completely into coding right but one thing i found in coding is of course i uh, learned with c c++ java c sharp when i switch from one to other it's completely different i have to learn a completely different set of things and after i switch to something i completely forget what's there in the other things right but that's when i realized when i uh, started taking uh, electronic circuits that time we learned with bjts and mosfets was taught at the end i found a common emitter common source it's same it's like you know i can't find six differences right and the and the first wow moment wow moment i had with circuits was when i kind of connected signals and systems to electronic circuits in signals and systems course you would have learned if you take a square wave which is periodic fourier what did he say the periodic square wave contains multiple sinusoidal frequencies and in uh, circuits i learned that if you have rc it acts like a low pass filter that filters uh, you know sinusoidal frequencies so that uh, made me think okay what if i take a square wave and put it into a you know cascade of rc filters will i get a sine wave and i put something in the simulator that time i had multisim so and then i found a sine wave it was like wow for me right that's something you will not get with programming because see you are writing some code you are you are telling the computer to do something if it does the same thing you will not be surprised right if it doesn't work that's when you will be surprised then that's where debugging starts but with circuits it's not the case we are basically playing with the fundamentals of you know physics and you know like uh, nature right and i mean of course this besides the fact that you know I, there is a demand for circuit designers and i get paid a lot that made me switch to circuit design but that's the different right of course finally i didn't end up joining industry i like teaching so i joined here so hopefully i'll train you guys to join industry right and see like i told when i was growing up it was it revolution now we are at the inflection point of semiconductor revolution right see like i told in the first class uh, 10 years back if you say i am doing chip design everyone would have thought you are designing lace chips or ampel chips <laughs> right but now it's not the case see similarly when i was growing up uh, programming was different that was the beginning of it revolution so 10 years before that if you told someone i am working in c they will think you are selling some something in the c side shop <laughs> right but then people realized okay c is a programming language it's the same thing right so yeah i mean see uh, now you guys are at the correct time so when you are graduating you will be witnessing this you know semiconductor revolution so there will be a huge demand for skilled circuit designers so it's a right time right and 
I will always say that you guys should feel proud of the fact that you are sitting in this class right now because the mere fact that you are sitting here means that we have this is the second level analog circuits course so which means you have successfully finished your first level analog circuits course 210 for UGs 610 for PGs so if you have done the course you have taken uh, you know basic electronics course you know circuit analysis where you learn KCL KVL signals and systems and for learning that you would have learned calculus that's what your entire 12 years of school was prepping up right so the fact that you are sitting here means that you have put consistent effort over the last several years right so which means circuit design is one field where the barrier to entry is very high and you guys are already kind of cleared the barrier right and typically that is not the case for uh, other things because see in other disciplines you will find that uh, they will say you know you do the six month course and then you can switch to this domain and you can earn so you'll see a lot of people you know after working several years in some domain they'll do the short term courses and switch to a different discipline but you'll never find that happening in circuit design you'll not see someone who has worked 20 years in something and suddenly say i want to design chips let me go to ta and design chips no it's not going to work right and that's why you never see this kind of short term online courses saying you do this six months job guaranteed in circuit design right so i mean there is nothing wrong in you know choosing uh, you know taking those kind of career profiles but i would suggest that in your future you make sure you steer your career in such a way that uh, the job positions you take have higher barrier of entry that will make sure that you are a valuable you know like you are a valuable asset to the company right and i mean of course make sure that that uh, you know job has i mean that field you specialize in has enough number of high paying jobs and circuit design is one such field where enough number of high paying jobs are there and you know like the barrier to entry is high right again i mean uh, again uh, it's not like you should always do this but the fact that you guys are in iitk means that you are the top people in the country so i would say you should not settle for something that easy right you're already here do something better yeah i mean so it's what i wanted to say to motivate you guys typically motivation is done in the introductory class <laughs> but uh, i feel that that should not be done because in the beginning of the semester everyone is ultra motivated <laughs> everyone wants to learn circuit design classical dance classical music you know rocket science you know quantum mechanics everything only after the mid semester they will you will get eh this is cool. and when the exam comes it's like this is even worth studying can i bunk the exam right so that's why i wanted to give some motivation at the end of the class so that you guys feel motivated to learn and do well in the answer right see uh, i mean like i told i mean uh, i already you guys have access to this virtual box setup with cadence so as long as you are associated with iitk you can always you know like experiment you know like explore and learn right and that's why i gave you the setup to everyone and i mean this is this licenses for these tools are actually very costly and uh, who do you think is providing the money for this huh you are not paying i mean okay indirectly we are paying uh, huh? yeah go uh, government is doing it i mean government through some schemes i mean we are part of a program through which the government is funding a lot of institutes to get this license of course we are paying taxes so it's all circulated but see if the government is paying so much to in investing so much see government will not uh, invest in something where there is not uh, any returns right so if the government is pushing so much then you can expect what will be the returns in the next few years so make sure that you utilize the resources you know like practice and be, get better so that's what i wanted to say yeah oh yeah i wanted to recap also okay so i'll just give a couple of minutes recap so yeah in the first half we started with a single transistor stage and then from there we made a defamp because we wanted to amplify difference between two signals and to improve the gain we uh, used you know cas code uh, and then that had folded cas code gain boosted cas code etc then we saw that you know uh, the gain is not high at all frequencies because of poles and zeros and for finding poles if there are uncoupled rc sections you just take conductance by capacitance else you see which capacitor is dominant and keep shorting it so that's what you do for zero again if you find that if when you are shorting m capacitor simultaneously in your circuit and the output is non zero it has m zeros and then we saw that for driving resistive load single stage is not good we went to multi stage so there we saw dominant pole compensation wherein you put a large cap at one node to reduce the pole to one frequency a better thing to do is miller compensation 
Uh, Miller added a right of plane zero. You could do ahuja compensation to uh, get rid of the RHP zero, or add that visitor in series. The alternating alternate ideas to use feed forward compensation. Again, the way I see it is, if you have a lot of poles in the system, that is like having a lot of naughty kids in a class or a home. So in a class, if you have a lot of naughty kids close to each other, the teacher separates them apart so that class is stable. That is Miller compensation. Feed forward is where you know like uh, uh, you add a zero. That is like making sure if two students are copying in an exam, the teacher will sit in between to make sure they don't copy. Same thing, you put a zero in between the poles to make sure that they are stable. In the second half, we basically saw fully differential op amps. The reason was single ended was having issues with ground disturbances, supply disturbances, etc. But here uh, you needed to have a common mode feedback that we saw. And then we saw some non idealities. So one was mismatch that resulted in offset. Second was noise and thermal noise we saw is something fundamental. So uh, one thing to reduce thermal noise is you take multiple circuits put in parallel that reduces the noise but increases power. So that inherently is a trade off. And finally we saw non-linearity. Again uh, one easy way technique to reduce uh, non-linearity is to put it in negative feedback. With respect to amplifier that was source regeneration. We also saw the uh, method of current injection to find weak non-linearities. And finally, we saw uh, important circuits using negative feedback like uh, band gap reference, LDOs, constant GM bias, etc. Right? So, we'll stop here. Uh, thank you for showing up for all the classes. This is my first class standing up and teaching because in all the classes, it was a small class I used to sit and teach. So, thank you for making me grow a spine. Yeah?